Hello, our world, and welcome back to another episode of Our World Talk. Uh, happy to have you guys here with us this morning. You had uh, previously asked us to have some of our general membership, not necessarily uh, just our leaders on the podcast. So we searched high and low, and we found uh, a very interesting uh, guest here in Bill Ryan. Bill, welcome this morning. Thanks, Chris. How happy are you? To be here. Great. Fantastic. Uh, so, Bill, you're a Chicago native, spent a good portion of your career uh, up north uh, building homes. So can you tell us a little bit about your advancement for home ownership in that city and, and what brought you down to South Florida and are you still building and developing? Uh, well, I'll start with my, my background in Chicago. So I grew up in the home building business. I started working in the business when I was 10 years old. My okay. parents had founded the business in 58. Uh, absolutely loved it. Knew that's what I wanted to do when okay. I grew up um, and then had uh, a great run. Uh, leading my my family's business, we grew from 500 homes to 1,500 homes in two years. Oh wow! Yeah. Uh, then we expanded into Minnesota and Florida. Okay. Um, it was just a great run. Um, I'm I have kind of an odd background. I have an accounting degree, but uh, I have strong talents in marketing and in design and those things, particularly okay. floor plan design. Accounting certainly helps in our business. Yeah, it does. And and so the f funny quick story was you, when you work in your family's business, you don't, you, you try to do what, where you need to be, right? You go where you need to be. You need to, if there's a problem that needs to get fixed, you just fix it. It doesn't matter, you know, what you really want to do. Sure. And uh, as it happened, what at the time I joined my family's business, uh, I asked my dad, where do you need help? He said, accounting. I'm like, man, I did not want to be. An account. Yeah, right. <laughs> and and it was the greatest thing. Um, one, I, I realized I got a great education uh, in college. And then I ended what up. What school did you go to? Notre Dame. Okay. And then I ended up. education there. I did. I did. Well, better than I valued at the time, right? And then I ended up computerizing the business. So it was right when computers were starting to really become uh, more commonplace in the workplace. Okay. Uh, so that was great. And then went out and we had adopted a new management style, project management style of uh, community management. So I was the guinea pig there. And then I came back as VP of sales and marketing. And that's when, you know, we really popped. And, and it was awesome. We were the first uh, production builder in Disney's celebration community. Oh, really? Which was a really terrific experience. Um, so you talked about home ownership and the importance of home ownership. I, I was very involved in our local home builders association in okay. Chicago. Um, in the late eighties, homelessness was becoming something we were more conscious of and something as an association that if we could be involved in improving that, helping that, you know, we, we wanted to. So, uh, I got involved in some great projects i was on the board for habitat for humanity for a while okay um love to hear people giving back yeah and frankly our home building company we were back in the 80s it was first time homeowners that we were serving okay uh the market as we all know has changed incredibly Thanks. since the 80s uh it continues to evolve and always will but um you know for me probably because of my background, but I, I just, home ownership is a big deal for me. And, you know, the affordability crisis that we have in all our major cities is a major big problem. issue as well. Right. So you asked if I'm building and developing today. My intention um, is to begin developing again. Okay. Uh, I moved to Florida to work for a builder here and then left that builder right before COVID uh, which was a strange time. And then, you know, the market really spiked, uh, which was so counterintuitive. Absolutely. Um, but I, yeah, I do, I do want to build again. It's just finding the right opportunity because of what's, you know, what's happened in the landscape. Sure. So to, let's talk about that landscape. You're yeah. now selling real estate in I South am. Florida. So how has business been for you lately? What are you seeing happening with the market? You know, as you've probably experienced, it's a, a very fickle market right now. And, you know, it's I, I have an odd background because I got my license about three years ago. 
Oh, really? I have built and sold 10,000 homes. Okay. Without a real estate license and without a GC license. Okay. Because when, when I was living in Illinois, I didn't need those to build new homes. Sure. So uh, when I left the home building company, I immediately got my license. I was really focused more on commercial. I mean, I was obviously going to do residential, but um, so it's been an interesting period for me because most of my real estate sales has been derivative of my home building business. Okay. So to be a more traditional agent, uh, I wouldn't say it's an adjustment necessarily, but um, it, it, it is, it's, it's got its challenges. Um, again, fortunately, I'm, I'm good with technology and I ended up at Compass, which is a great technology platform. So okay, that's been a good fit. And what's the uh, name of the uh, home builder company that um, you were running up in Chicago? Town & Country Homes. Town & Country Homes, yep. okay. So to, one of your websites says that you are driving innovation in the real estate industry. So can you give us some examples of that innovation? And sure. What are some things that need to change in the future? Uh, well, I think there are a lot of things that we hope will change in, in our industry. Um, the, on the innovation side, um, I started a, an import business about two years ago. Okay. Uh, we import cabinets, tops, and other products from Italy. Um, got into the business through just a kind of a chance meeting with uh, a client, uh, actually my partner's client, and I saw the opportunity and, and we've been pursuing it. Um, I, I joke a little bit because uh, it is such a passion project for me. Okay. Uh, I love Italy, the people I've had, the pleasure of meeting and, and working with is just unbelievable. It's, it's, it's like a gift. And at this period of my career, it's, uh, it's, it's a nice thing to have. I have another brand called the high performance home. This is, um, one that I, I'm very focused on and, and I'm hoping to drive innovation and improvement in home building. Okay. Um, are we talking like the internet of things? We're, talking more about quality construction okay. and it's a real challenge in this market to build you know we're constrained labor is constrained right uh, during covid there were all kinds of disruptions in the supply chain and so construction schedules have been a real challenge and you can talk to anybody that's been trying to build a new home right uh, it's very unpredictable well, we did lose uh, a ton of builders back in uh, the big crash. And with that, lost a lot of tradespeople as well. And that it ended did. up moving on to other things that have just not come back into the pool of laborers. Right. So what the High Performance Home is trying to do is, is address the way we assemble housing. If you look at commercial real estate, the fit and finish is so far superior to residential. And it's almost like you're just snapping parts together. Okay. That simplifies it a little right. bit. but. There has not been a lot of innovation in methods and practices and products in home building. And I think we need that. Um, I think we need a way, uh, this might sound a little sacrilegious to home builders, but um, the, the labor GC tension that exists, um, it doesn't work toward the benefit of the homeowner. Okay. And so we need to realign some of those forces. And um, so our, our main focus is to try to focus on components and improving the performance level of components. And then we're creating a digital platform to connect the trades to the components where it's, think of it as Angie's List on steroids, where you could go okay. through and just kind of click the remodeling components that you might want in your home and uh, hit submit and the labor, you don't see the labor in that transaction, but it's attached to every component. So okay. it's, it's an ambitious platform. Um, I think it's um, a mission that benefits everybody in, in the, the home building and home service landscape. So okay. yeah, we'll see. I just heard about uh, a home builder that uh, just opened up a big factory in Pompano where they're basically um, pre-manufacturing components for homes. I did do, 
with big machines, basically putting together the, the walls and, and everything that you need in order to build a home. And then it just goes and gets assembled on site. I thought so, that was a, a fascinating way to, to do things these days. It is. And it's been going on for years. In, in 86, I started my first company. It was a home building company. Everything that I built was component assembly. So the walls got built in the plant. Everything came on site. Then it was kind of uh, snapped together, if you will. Sure. Um, there, there are challenges. You know, in Chicago, which is where I had that company, you couldn't close the wall because the inspectors had to look at your frame construction, then they had to look at your rough sure. mechanicals. So you couldn't build the whole home in the plant. The advantages of building in the plant is you stay out of the weather and pre-climate change, the weather in Chicago was brutal in the wintertime. Right. Uh, plus we would get a lot of rain. So there were advantages there. You know, there have been so many iterations of companies trying to do what you're talking about right now. And there are some real, I think, fascinating business models out there. Um, what we need is a little bit more cooperation from government to to help facilitate the the inspection process and, and other things. If we had uh, a national building code and you could have uh, closed walls inspected in the plant and then shipped to the job site, that would make a huge difference. Now, is there a difference because down here in South Florida, we're building everything out of concrete as opposed to frame construction that you dealt with up north? That's a challenge. And there, there, is, there, there have been some uh, perspective innovations in, in how to build that wall. In fact, when we were um, first building in Disney, there was a company that had a manufactured block that wasn't uh, CBS. It was... Um, it was a different process. Think of like a manufactured wood floor, that kind of a, of an engineering process. Okay. But you could use a router to route pipes and other things through the walls out in the field. So some real advantages there, but it didn't take off. So yeah, in Florida, um, that's a challenge, uh, it, but it's also a benefit. You know, when you have concrete block construction, um, there are a lot of things, particularly in this climate, that you don't have to worry about. Right. Um, when you're looking for resale homes and you're looking at frame construction versus concrete block, that can be a challenge sometimes. Okay. So to, let's talk about, uh, you, you're obviously, uh, to, I shouldn't say obviously, we're, we're going to talk about uh, you having a passion for uh, motivating others. And you are now a author. Uh, you've got a book called Fix Your Why. Uh, can you give us a glimpse into that book and let us know where we can purchase a copy? Sure. It's available on my website, thebillryan.com. Okay. At fixyourwhy.com. Um, it's available on Amazon as well. Okay. Uh, you know, I, again, I told you, I, I'm, I'm a little strange. I wear a couple different hats and use both sides of my brain, but uh, I've been wanting to write for 30 years. Okay. Uh, thought you know, 30 years, it was going to be a novel, maybe a screenplay. Um, never found the time to do it, never got around to doing it. And uh, I got involved with a group at Compass called the 6 AMers, where we were up every morning at 6 AM. Um, maybe Tuesday, Thursday, we would do, we'd participate in a Zoom call with some uh, interesting person. And then Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we would be answering questions of the day. Okay. And through that process, uh, I just got clear on what I wanted to write about. So the book has three parts. First part is my story, just, you know, my, my background, uh, the success we achieved at my family's business. Sure. The, the second part are the practices that I used. I, I was, uh, I leaned on technology, but I was very process oriented. We, as a company, we were the inaugural winner of the National Housing Quality Award. So quality process was a really big deal for us. And then the third part of the book is life hacks and just things that are important to me that have helped me kind of get through the challenges that I've experienced in my life. And, uh, you know, hopefully that third part will help others. And I'm working Every, Everybody's on, looking for life hacks. Yeah, every, I think every so. Day. Yeah, I mean, what, I didn't even know what that meant, right? Three or four years ago, but now we all, it's become part of our everyday uh, verbiage. 
And we're not talking about ways to clean your shower, guys. We're talking about <laughs> ways to yeah, you get yourself motivated, fix up your life. Yeah, and I'm working on two different books right now that uh, I'm hoping to have one out in, in the fall. So we'll see. Okay. Well, fantastic. We'll put a copy of this up so everybody can see and uh, they can go and check it out on, uh, on Amazon or, or, or thebillryan.com. Uh, so, to, Bill, you, you certainly possess an entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, I find that there are many realtors who want to branch out into other things. So do, you're a builder, you're an author, uh, accountant, and uh, certainly a realtor as well. So do, can you give uh, our realtors a couple tips on how to be more entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial and think differently about what they're doing? Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I mentioned the 6 AMers. It's a, a very rare group of agents at Compass. Um, I collaborate with agents across the whole country, uh, agents that I really admire. And I would say most of them are very entrepreneurial. They're very successful. Right. They, well, we're all business owners, right? Exactly what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. They look at their activities as a business a as a whole. And that, that's yeah. the way you should be doing it if you want to be successful. That's what I think. Absolutely. The, the entrepreneurial tips, I, th I think, you know, I would, the advice I would give to anybody is to understand the unique value that you offer your clients. You know, for me, um, my background, I can go into houses that might need to be remodeled. Uh, I look at an inspection report differently than a lot of agents look at it. Um, and, and I drive that value in the way that I interact with my clients. Pricing strategies, you know, we all, uh, I'll use the word struggle with that, right? I mean, it's not, uh, the marketplace can be really difficult. Um, right. It can fluctuate a lot. Um, so I've had a deep background in pricing strategies. It was part of the reason that we succeeded and grew the way that we did. But sometimes it's very hard to articulate that to a seller. They've got an idea in their head of what their home is worth. And I mean, it, you, you could pound it into their heads all day long and show them all the data that we have, pure facts. And they still will say, I think my home's worth another hundred thousand dollars of what you're telling me. Right. And they right. shoot themselves in the foot because then the home ends up sitting on the market a little bit too long. And then people, you know, it's got a stigma attached to it now. People wonder why the home hasn't sold. And nine times out of 10, it's because the seller refused to listen to us as realtors when we were talking with them about that pricing strategy. Absolutely. And you know, from your experience, you, you know when you're working with a pro, right? And we also know that not every agent approaches their business um, the same way. They don't maybe have um, the commitment to information that I think you need today. I mean, right. there's so much information Absolutely. that we have to be able to have at, at our fingertips for our clients, you know, on the fly sometimes. Right. Um, and I, you know, that, that's another way I think for agents to be entrepreneurial is find ways to leverage the technology that's out there today to make you better at providing and distilling and distributing information to your clients. Right. Yeah. We, we do have uh, access to uh, some, pretty big data analytics yep. um, that certainly can help us in our businesses. It's just a matter of using those tools and making sure that you can present to your customer something very articulate that you can say, this is exactly the research that I've done. This is all the data that I've crunched. This is what's been happening in your neighborhood. This is what your list price should be or that range of list price. Now, if you want to go a little bit higher, this are the potential pitfalls. If you go the other way, then we might have people beating down the door, giving you multiple offers. So yeah. it's uh, it's important to to really make sure that you understand the data that you're presenting to the consumer. That's the key, right? I mean, you know, we so many of us we we do our weekly or monthly newsletter and we regurgitate the statistics that we either get from the brokerage we're working with or we get it here from you know our our MLS service, and that's great, but. You, you just don't want to spew factual statistics, right? You have to understand what those trends mean. You have to see trends, right? You know, and all those of us that have been in the business long enough, um, we have a great respect for trends. You know, you, you, you can have contrary opinions to the trend, 
but you're not going to beat the trend. No. You know, it's, it's going, it has a momentum of its own. And it's going to do what it's going to do. Yeah, you just exactly. have to understand it. Uh, to, so to, looking at your business uh, portfolio and the companies that you've been a part of, there is uh, certainly a common denominator, which is collaboration. And you had mentioned uh, that before with uh, working with your uh, agents on those six o'clock morning phone calls. It's all about the spirit of collaboration. So how tricky is it to um, start a business with others, number one? And uh, what sort of pros and, and cons have you have you seen? Oh, gosh. Um a lot of that's in my book. I, I've been very lucky in my career um, to be able to collaborate with some really talented people. I, um, when I was really young, I, I stumbled upon this idea called the mastermind principle, where two minds come together and create a third. And for me, and I don't know why, you know, it, it popped out the way it did for me or resonated the way it did for me. Um, but it just made sense. And, and so as a, a leader, and I was fortunate in my family's business because on paper, I, didn't, I wasn't qualified to lead some of the people okay. at, at a young age, uh, but I had the opportunity because it was my family's business. And leadership was, I, I'm definitely one of those people that was born to be a leader, and I find myself in that position a lot. But I also respect being a leader. And, um, you know, you've heard of servant leader and, um, I don't know if I like that label necessarily, but my leadership model is to lift those up that I'm either I'm leading, but I really think of it more as kind of King Arthur's round table. We, you know, there's no seniority at the table when we get, when we come to the table and we're trying to brainstorm an idea or come up with some new idea, everyone's got an equal place at that discussion okay and you're doing it right <laughs> yeah yeah and I think that's what collaboration is all about is to and, and to watch somebody particularly some of the younger employees that I have mentored through my career watch them grow and watch them have those aha moments when they have you know they trust the process they respect the people they're collaborating with and they see that third mind to see that in other people is really cool yeah to, you're absolutely doing it right and i think one of the uh, one of the coolest things is to watch somebody who you've mentored and you've led come up behind you and end up doing greater things than you ever thought that you could absolutely do. i mean that's the whole reason why we're doing what we're doing as leaders is trying to make the person uh who we're bringing up behind us uh, totally outmatch us and 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 run us right over because that's the only way that you're going to move forward. I can only do so much. I can only learn so much. But somebody else who also has that bright mind and is thinking outside the box, and hopefully they're collaborating with other people that are making them even smarter so that they can be better leaders. Yeah, and when they grow, you grow, right? Absolutely. Because you know, as each team. of us gets better, we kind of ratchet each other up. Absolutely. Um, and again, I've uh, w one of the things that I value early is diversity of the team that I would collaborate with. You know, I, if everyone was thinking the same way, you're not going to have an effective collaboration. That does not work. When, when people are bringing something unique to the discussion, you can really come up with some right. terrific ideas. And if nobody ever disagrees with you, you're never going to have uh, yeah. uh, another original thought. You've got to make sure that uh, people are constantly pushing each other. So d that being said, I know myself as a leader, I've always had uh, mentors and uh, I I couldn't imagine going through a day without uh, trying to feed my brain with something that uh, I don't already know. So do, do you have some uh, mentors that, that you work with on a consistent basis? You know, more so today on the mentor, not, not the person being mentored. Coming up through my career, um, I was kind of the young buck. Again, I, I was fortunate to have some opportunities um, offered to me, you know, again, maybe before I was particularly qualified or had a CV that said I was capable. <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, I outworked everybody, you know, that was important to me as someone whose name was on the door, you know, they have the same name as the founder. Um, I just adopted early on in my career that I didn't want anything given to me because of my name. So the way to do that is you have to outwork everybody. And I was always trying to innovate. And sometimes, you know, that 
was a challenge for the people that I led because I was always, I, not that I was never satisfied, but I was always pushing the envelope. But through the years, uh, one of my first mentors was my interior designer out of California, Carol Aiken. She demonstrated to me a passion for the home building industry that I had not seen before. Okay. Home builders are historically or stereotypically, they come from the construction side. So they understand the sticks and bricks of it. She came from the design side, the marketing side. Okay. She really understood demographics, how to understand your customer, how to appeal to the psychographic needs of your buyers. Um, so she was, she was a great mentor. I worked with some of the best architects in the industry. We, all of our architects uh, in the 90s were from California. So that's okay. where the best architecture was being done. Okay. And, you know, I, I had a knack for uh, architectural design, but just like we talked about, you know, watching someone you're mentoring grow, I was the young kid growing. You know, I was at a table with these architects who were very accomplished. I was very hungry for the business and I would soak up everything that they could teach me. And eventually um, I got to a, a, a peer level with them and we were, you know, co-creating together. And that's, that's when the magic happens. I see that a lot in our industry as far as uh, realtors are concerned, just trying to soak up as much knowledge as you possibly can for anybody who uh, is fresh into the business. And you know, do, we've had a couple of podcast guests where we talked about what's happened since the pandemic and people not coming back to the office. Uh, one of our um, guests that we just had was uh, Tim Weishire, who is the president-elect for Florida Realtors. And he sat here and we had talked about when he had first got his start, sitting in a little closet of, a, of an office that he was uh, given by his first broker uh, right next to the copy room and would just sit there and soak up every one of those conversations that were happening right there at the copier to try to get as much knowledge and information as he possibly could about the industry that he was starting off in. And I think it, you could that could translate into any industry that you're in, it, it, really trying to gather as much information as you possibly can to help you along your way. Because everybody's on a journey, constantly getting better and better at uh, this craft. Um, it is nice to hear that uh, even you as a builder were you know, soaking up the information from the designers, the architects, trying to be uh, the best that you possibly could be. And I still do. I mean, even though I have you know, 40 years experience in the real estate business, even longer if you go back to my summer jobs, um, I've been somebody who believed I don't know anything. You know, I, you, I'm just constantly trying to learn, trying to read. And again, you know, I've only been a, an agent for three or four years. So, um, in, in some ways I'm a newbie, but you know, I have a, a deep background that, that I get to draw on. Um, uh, but I'm still, I'm still the student. I'm still trying to learn everything I can. And I have, as we all should be. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the, the most important attribute in that is believing you need to learn something and believing that someone has something to teach you. Right. I mean, Absolutely. if you value your colleagues and, uh, in fact, I learn a ton from my clients. I have been really lucky in, in my short agent career to work with some really smart clients. You know, they challenge me. Sure. We have a level of dialogue that's kind of, I, th I would say, is elevated because of my background. But, you know, they're smart people, too. And, uh, and together, you know, we're collaborating to try to solve a puzzle. That's what real estate is on, on the resale side, right? Just trying to solve that puzzle. And um, I'm not, you know, I, I, I never, I'm not that guy that says, this is where you should be priced. I'm the guy that probably create probably gives you too much information, too much data. Right. I'll synthesize that data, but I really want my clients to to make decisions about, you know, price and obviously I'm I'm dictating a lot of right of the information they're you know, they're synthesize they're dealing with. But um yeah, I, I think particularly with young agents, um 
I don't know if this is a better time or not for a new agent, right? Because technology is so much more advanced than it was even 10 years ago. Um, so in some ways that makes it easier, but as you mentioned earlier, the amount of data that we get presented to us on a daily basis, overwhelming. it's overwhelming. Right. Yeah, and I think the um, consumers at this point, uh, to, well, I think a lot of the agents take that technology that we have. Yes, it's there to, to make your lives easier. Yes, it helps when you're out there practicing this craft. Um, but sometimes the technology could be too much for you and people lose sight of the fact that this is a relationship-based business and creating those relationships are really what's going to get you to the finish line and get somebody to allow you to be their trusted advisor. You could have all the data in the world, you could have all the technology in the world, but the consumer has access to a lot of that data and a ton of that technology. It's really about creating those relationships and, and sort of bringing it in and making sure that uh, the consumer that you're working with trusts your opinion. So that way, when you are giving them all that data, hopefully they're going to look to you and say, okay, thanks for all the information. What do I do? Yeah. Now, I think you, you, you nailed it there. And, and the, the word that to me jumps out and is most important is trust. Absolutely. And trust has nothing to do with real estate or data or information. Trust is how you build relationships with others. And, you know, you, you want to be a trusted resource. You also need to trust the judgment of maybe it's a colleague, maybe it's your client. Um, and, and to me, that's when it's fun, right? Because now it's, it's again, because I like to collaborate, but it's, it's a productive collaboration sure. rather than, you know, an adversarial right. uh, experience. Right. For sure. For sure. Uh, so I do know that, uh, you are a busy guy. We are going to let you, uh, get out of here. We're going to wrap this one up with, uh, the last question that I ask of everybody who's on the podcast. Uh, tell us about a little South Florida gem or, or hot spot that you found that you love, that you want to share with the listeners could be a beach, a hotel, a restaurant, a park, something that, uh, you love about living in South Florida. Certainly, um, I'm sure you're not missing the cold of Chicago, but <laughs> I, I, I love, I love being in Florida. Uh, I was I was saying earlier I, di I didn't think if you would have asked me ten years ago I would not have said that I would be living in Florida but I came here uh, you know for a business opportunity turned out to be ten minutes from my parents okay. uh, in their later years and I was able to be you know of help to them which was wonderful um, probably the you know I, I have so, there are so many gems right where we live we're so lucky uh, you know so many people describe where we live as paradise. But I'm a real foodie. I love to cook. Okay. Um, Everybody's love, ears just perked up. Yeah. I love going to restaurants. On the island, my favorite restaurant is Bukan and the Conley Group. They're awesome. Uh, near my home, I live in Palm Beach Gardens. Uh, Stage Kitchen is an okay. apps. I don't know if you know. Have you been there? No. I, I've been to either. And uh, what I end up doing is going to all these places uh, after I hear the podcast back on Friday morning, I'm like, okay, I've got to pick one of these places for the weekend and go check it out. Pushkar is is the chef at Stage and one of the owners, and he he grew up in India. Okay, so he brings uh, a very talented use of spices to his meals. And is that an Indian restaurant? No, it's actually uh, it it's Indian influence, and then they open an, another. Um, restaurant called Ela Curry Kitchen. So okay. that is more um, Indian, but Stash I'm a huge fan of Indian food. Go to Stash. Okay. It's incredible. Okay. And it's a great experience. Fantastic. Well, you guys heard it right here on Our World Talk. Go check out Stash. Uh, keep an eye out for uh, Mr. Bill Ryan and what uh, he's got planned on the future with a couple more books coming out. Uh, but for now, uh, check out Fix Your Why. You can find that on Amazon or thebillryan.com. Thank you for being with us, sir. Thanks, Chris. All right, everybody. Have a great day. Enjoy the weekend.